Good morning again. We're here. Isn't that amazing? We're here. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. We're all here. And uh, I tell you, I, I didn't know this was going to happen, but uh, yeah, I got a couple people. Uh, so thankful. I, it's my highest honor. This whole project has been a partnership with uh, Clayton Construction. And uh, we haven't just formed a business relationship. We have formed a close personal relationship. And some of the Clayton guys are here. And they're going to love me for this, really. Um, so would you all just stand? Let's sing together. No, I'm just kidding. Would you all at least stand? Let us stand and let us see you. This is the folks from Clayton that have helped us get the thing going. Uh, they're all just quality people, quality, quality people, and uh, very, very thankful, very thankful that you're here and also for this place, and I'm glad you get to meet uh, some more of the people that you helped do all this for. Um, also, just another thing that I just was told on the way in, uh, uh, Mo Philip Moore, are you here? Can I see you? Stand up, brother. Welcome back from Afghanistan, Bronze Star Award winner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, Major, Major Philip Moore, Bronze Star Award winner. I think that's impressive. I'm glad you're here. Uh, his family's been here and serving while he's been over, over there, so it's, been, it's good to have him here with us. Hey, uh, next uh, Sunday is Easter, as you're well aware, and um, you can see we're going to have some problems. So uh, it would be great uh, if some of you wanted to kind of shuffle over to 9 uh, o'clock service. I promise you it would be the same thing. And, um, in fact, it's probably a little better because right now I'm kind of tired. But it would be a little better. <clears throat> but, um, uh, but 9 o'clock, and that would make us some room for some other folks. Uh, we have an overflow opportunity in the chapel, but we want to get as many people as we can in here. Also, just a little sidebar note. Uh, we have done zero Easter planning as far as uh, to the community because we just are slack like that this year, but we are moved. We did get here, and uh, so if you could kind of help me as the end of the week comes, just put it on your Facebook. Just say, hey, uh, let's come worship together, and we'll, we have a great service plan. There's some awesome things, and you're going to love it, so just do that and help invite folks to come. Well, as I said, it's amazing that we're finally here, and literally it has been years of hard work and planning and hours of prayer and countless sacrifices to kind of give and serve, and we're, we're finally here. And in the next few weeks, we're going to celebrate that in grand fashion, okay? As we head into April, the whole month of April is set aside to celebrate that. And actually, on April 21st, we're going to have a special service. We have special guests coming in, have a special service that evening, an open house. We're going to do that all in April. And that's really important that we got here. But the most important thing is Easter, and Easter is the reason we got here. And Easter is next Sunday. So we're going to take all of our attention, turn it toward Easter, and do that really well. And then uh, come, uh, come April, we're going to really talk about this church and the uniqueness of this church and, and why it's here. Um, last week, we started this series called Shoes, and I uh, introduced you, you remember, to a guy named Nicodemus, and it's kind of this weird little catch thing, and we're basically talking about fine people that Jesus met and Jesus interacted with. And so this morning, I want to do a little interactive thing with you. So I'm going to put some pictures of shoes on the screen, and you just call out whose shoes they are. You, is everybody with me? Okay, let's try this. That was Dorothy. Great, great. That was good. It's like, Dorothy over here. They're really loud. I understand. I used to do that too in class. You wait for someone to say the right answer. Okay, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let's do another one. Cinderella. Cinderella. That's right. Cinderella. Okay, keep going. Let's do another one. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Okay, one more. I can actually do... Okay, never mind. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Okay. You did well. Let's do this. Let's take it up a notch. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to play different clips of different songs, and I want you to sing along. And at some point, I'm going to pull the song, and I want you to finish that particular line. Now, just a warning. You all could look really silly when this is done, okay? I'm okay because I'm not singing, but you all could really look funny. Okay, so are you ready? First one's easy. Well, it's one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and I go, can't go. But... Okay, not bad, not bad. It was pretty good. You know, you folks that are rhythmically challenged didn't really know when to come in, um, and, and, and I was there with you. You know, I understand. Okay, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let's try another one. This is fun. These boots are made. Yeah, people get sassy on that one, don't they? They're sassy. I was noticing the second service, which is our traditional group, man, they were grabbing the pew. Wow, I mean, it's just serious. 
Whatever that was, there's just something about us that we like to say that one. Okay, I got some more. I got some more. Let's do another one. Remember this movie? Come on! Oh, you guys are amazing. You guys are really good. Okay, now listen, I put this last one in here because I'm giving you a chance to embellish at the end. So work on your embellishment. Here we go. Very good, very good. Give yourself a hand clap. You all did wonderful. You did great. Best service so far. No, hands down. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, the whole point of that is Jesus was able to meet all kinds of people and form relationships with all different kinds of people, no matter what they were wearing. He was able to form a relationship with Nicodemus, who you remember was wearing wingtips. And uh, he said, hey, he formed his relationship. You could come somewhere else, Nicodemus. It's not, you don't have to just stay where you are. You can come somewhere else. Today, I want to introduce you to someone who, who Jesus encountered or encountered Jesus. And this person was a person that we would all say needed a little bit more grace. This would be a person that you'd look at and say, man, uh, that person there is just doesn't have it all working very well for her. And, um, and this person, you might even say, kind of there, if society had a ladder, you know, this person would be hanging on the last, last rung of the ladder. And uh, the lady's attire of the person I want to talk to you today is probably would be uh, kind of represented by a, by a stiletto. Now, a little bit about a stiletto. I want to give you a little history about this particular shoe. Stiletto is actually an Italian term. And the Italian term means dagger. This is a stiletto. It's a, it's a very cheap one because it won't close. But it is a stiletto. And, uh, and this was actually given to the Ital- to Italian army. They were given stilettos. So when eventually this design came over into shoe world, they tried to make a heel that looked like a dagger. Thank you. Thank you for somebody. I mean, I worked hard on that part. I had to go look that up. I don't know that stuff. But anyway, there it is. And, uh, and so we get this stiletto, and that's how the whole thing. Well, in the 1970s, the platform shoe took over for the stiletto. And the stiletto kind of faded into the background because everybody's wearing these platform shoes. And at that point, stilettos kind of became associated at that point in history with a more seedy part of our culture, a more women of the night, and even, even prostitutes. Now, today, just to be clear, uh, fashion has turned again, and these are actually very much in style. So if you're wearing these today... Let's avoid the awkward moment, shall we? <laughs> and let's just say, hey, you look great. <laughs> you really do. You look great. Okay. <laughs> I thought I handled that pretty well. Don't you think it just kind of rolled smooth? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, the lady we meet today, she's in this dark place in her life. And, and, if, and as I said, she's just at the bottom of the ladder. And shame and guilt kind of are her constant companions, this lady. And uh, she wasn't just ashamed of her yesterday, but she was still in the midst of it. And we know this. Uh, she was actually ashamed of her today's as well. And she bore the weight of decisions that she was making and, and had made. In fact, she had a reputation. And this lady, her reputation really wasn't a good one. She was the one that people would kind of whisper about when she walked through the store. And you could just see them kind of and kind of looking kind of thing. And that's the, the, the lady that meets Jesus, John chapter 4. Pharisees heard that Jesus was, was, gaining, or was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples, verse 3. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Now let me just pause because those are a whole bunch of places that we don't know where they are and they don't mean anything unless you check this out. Listen, basically what the deal is, Jesus is down here in Judea, okay? He wants to go up here to Galilee. In the middle of this whole deal is Samaria. This is the do not travel zone, okay? And over in the Holy Land, there are these rivers. There's this river and these two seas. This is the River Jordan. You've heard the River Jordan somewhere along the way? This is the River Jordan. Here's the deal. If you were in Judea and you wanted to go to Galilee, there was only one way that you went. You went up like this, you crossed the river, And then you came back this way. Everybody went that way because you were trying to avoid Samaria at all costs. 
They just didn't mess with Samaritans. This would be as natural as if I said to you, hey, we're headed to Easley for lunch. Everybody hop on 123. For the Jewish people, this is kind of how the deal went. This is, this is what they felt. But what the scripture writer is telling us is this. Jesus is in Judea. He wants to go to Galilee. But he's choosing. He feels prompted in his heart to go through Samaria. And that's going to be a big deal. Jesus doesn't do what normally would be done. He actually goes out of his way, and he puts up with all the cultural junk and prejudice and hatred here in Samaria. Jesus does this. John chapter 4, verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Jacob's well was there. You can look it up. His well is still there. And Jesus tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Just to kind of be clear on this, the sixth hour would have been about noon. So what that means is Jesus and his disciples went somewhere between 20 and 30 miles before noon, hiking, right? So they're, they were busting it on this trail that they were doing. When he was there, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Keep, keep in mind, they, they'd busted it all morning. The disciples had already gone into town to get some hardies. Because you know hardies was still around back then, right? You know that. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Now, just to pause for a moment. Have you ever noticed when it comes to people who need grace, who need more grace? Have you ever noticed that we tend to make up classifications and classifications are kind of inevitable? We kind of put people in different boxes and follow them, follow them into different systems. It seems, I think, that we're more comfortable if people are different than we are to put them in a box. It makes us feel safer or even superior. If you and I are different, if I can just put you over here in this classification, then that will explain how you and I can keep being different. And I see this happen all the time in culture. See if you can understand what, I, what I'm saying. In this one, it's Jew and Samaritan. It's man and woman. But, you know, ones I've heard are like uh, rich and poor. I've heard, you know, pretty and ugly, single and divorced, faithful, unfaithful, addicted, not addicted, lonely, loved, outcast, accepted, failure, success, in crowd, out crowd, attractive, ugly, religious, non-religious, saint, sinner. You know, whoever said sticks and stones will make my bones, but words never hurt me, that person is a liar. Isn't it true? You know what I've learned? The older I'm getting, the more hurt I am by words. And, you know, you can recall times in your life when maybe you were put in a classification. And I'm at the stage now where I get put in a classification, whatever, but what's really painful, what kind of makes your blood boil, is when your kids get slapped into a classification. Isn't it true? Well, that's exactly the scenario that Jesus is dealing with when he comes to this woman wearing these questionable shoes. He's dealing with this classification thing. So this lady in stilettos shows up at the well at noon, now, the other thing, nobody would go to the well at noon. It was the heat of the day. Nobody got water in the heat of the day. Everybody went in the morning. All the women of the town went to the well in the morning. It was kind of a social event, and everybody got their water for the day, and then they went home, except for this lady. She's the only one, and she shows up at the well at noon. See, when you are classified by society, when you are judged by society, when you wear a scarlet letter because of your role, what you've done in society, you try to avoid society. You go to Walmart at night. You don't want anybody to see you, and you don't want to have any conversations with people that would be awkward. And so the woman goes to the well at noon, and there she encounters Jesus. Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is that asked you for a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. 
where can you get this living water? And this is this huge moment in this story, huge moment in this encounter, because the woman has expressed an interest in the water. The woman acknowledges that when she was, that what she has been doing to quench her thirst, all the behavior she's been doing to try to satisfy this longing inside of her isn't working. And when Jesus talks about a water that could quench her thirst, she is drawn into this discussion because she is just like me and she's just like you. And that is she is seeking peace for shame and guilt events in her life. And she's trying all these different things, and none of them are working. And then I kind of picture this moment, Jesus leaning over the edge of the well, looking down there, perhaps into the water, and he says this, verse 13. You know, everybody who drinks of this water will one day be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, they will never be thirsty again. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the idea that such a thing exists, and the woman has no clue, the idea that such a thing exists is so compelling to this woman, is so hope-producing for this woman in questionable footwear. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water where I am most ashamed and constantly reminded of my shame and constantly reminded of my guilt. Give me the water so I can be free. Could this really exist? Could a woman who wears these kind of shoes really be free from the reputation that goes with them? Could I no longer thirst? And then Jesus gets very personal. I love this. First time in the story. He says, listen, this is so cool. Go call your husband and come back. And the woman, I think, in a ticked off kind of manner, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you doggone right. Well, kind of. It's kind of a loose translation. But that's kind of what he said. He said, no, you don't have a husband. You've had five of them. And the guy you're with now is not your husband. You see what happened there? Everything was so cool. What had become this casual conversation and this woman, this is a nice man. He's talking to me. He doesn't know who I am. And he's talking to me about living water and never thirsting again. This is a great man. And then Jesus throws this zinger in there to have this pleasant conversation. Now it's become threatening to the woman in these shoes. And we've made this significant move in the story. A move that is so important. If you call yourself Christian, this move is so important that you get a hold of this. You see, people love to talk about Jesus. All kinds of people love to talk about Jesus. Sometimes people say to me, you know, Tom, all we really need to do is focus on Jesus. And that's not true. That's not true. All kinds of people talk about Jesus. All kinds of people are willing to talk about Jesus. The real struggle comes when Jesus wants to talk about how we live. And that's the point where so often people make their exits. I want to talk about love and grace and mercy and redemption, and frankly, so do I. I love those things. But I want to talk about my behavior. I don't want to talk about my beliefs that contradict Jesus. I have my own version of Jesus. I have an experience with him, and it's just different than the one in Scripture, but I've had it. Another way that I think people say it is, we've fallen in love with the Savior, but we've rejected the Lord. It's kind of like, I want to be saved, I just don't want to be led. Let me tell you guys, I've done that. And it will result in a train wreck of huge proportions. And you will find yourself at some point down the road hitting such a wall and thinking, not only are you in a desperate position, but you can't even reach for faith because the faith you thought you had didn't work because you never embraced him as Lord. You just had him save your soul, but you never wanted to live your soul for him. And that's exactly where this woman is. This incredibly now awkward conversation So the woman in Scripture, 
She's no different than I am and you are. And so you know what she does? She tries to change the subject. Sir, the woman says, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in the mountain, but you Jews claim the place we worship must be in Jerusalem. And she's just trying to change the subject. Let's get this off me. Let's not make it personal. We believe differently. Don't judge me. And it's always the case of someone who's trying to hide in a lifestyle that's producing shame and guilt or fear and worry. Well, I just don't see it that way. That's not the Jesus I know. And so we just run and we shut out people and skip scripture that's contrary to how we live. And this lady tries to close the door, but this Jesus, he just goes right with her. He says, you know, you're right. You all worship there. We worship here, but God is spirit. And worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now, what happens next is, is so massively huge. Because Jesus is getting ready to do something he has only done twice in all of Scripture. In the next verse, Jesus says to her, I know the Messiah is coming. In the next verse, Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Jesus claims to be the Messiah only twice in all of Scripture. And one of those times was to a Samaritan woman wearing stilettos. Anybody else love their Jesus right now? Isn't that... <laughs> all the other opportunities, all the massive crowds of people, all the people in higher authorities, people in better classifications. But no, Jesus says to the woman, I'm the Messiah. You know, kind of, I don't know what he did. I don't know. <laughs> I'm the Messiah. Jesus says that to the Samaritan woman, I am the Messiah. And right after that happens, I'm the Messiah. The disciples show up with hardies. It's in there. It's in the Bible. It's in there. Listen. And so there's this awkward conversation taking place between Jesus and this woman that Jesus picked up while the disciples were getting hardies. And the disciples have no clue what's going on. Keep that in mind. They don't know what happened. They've never seen Jesus with a girlfriend, but maybe this is what he, what he wants. I don't know. And they walk up into this conversation, and I picture Jesus and this woman locked eyeball to eyeball. I'm the Messiah. And the woman is letting that reality settle in all over her. And then the Scriptures say, she breaks the gaze, and the woman went back to the town and said to the people, listen, listen to this. Come and see the man who told me what? Now, that just got weird, didn't it? Come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Come and see the man who told me everything. And the people in town, they knew this woman's reputation. And so when they hear that there's a man over at the well who knew everything this woman ever did, it's like desperate housewives in Samaria. I mean, this was a huge deal. And they're saying, I'm in reality TV at its best. I'm going to go hear this. And so they did. They all like packed in the caravans, <laughs> okay, in the buses, and they made their way to the well. And they got there. They, the Samaritans, the untouchables, the people that everybody worked to avoid, came out of the town, made their way. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And Jesus actually ended up staying two days right here. And because of his words, many more became believers. 
This is what I wrestle with, guys, just as a Christian. And I don't know if you wrestle with this or not. I wrestle with this. Jesus has this ability to reveal a person's sin to them. He didn't water it down. He didn't hide it. And yet sinners liked him. He told her everything she did. And yet she was head over heels for this guy. He was this masterful teacher who held the tension of compassion for the sinner and the truth of what he came to do in this delicate balance. And that is so tough. I was thinking about this. I wonder if the church hasn't got this whole thing kind of messed up, honestly. See, our sin and the sins of other people doesn't have to drive us from Jesus. It can actually draw us to Jesus. And maybe the person you're encountering wearing whatever footwear that puts you, has you put them in a classification, maybe they're being drawn to Jesus. And your conversation and your interaction will, will impact that. Maybe that's what's happening. And these Samaritans, outcasts and rejects, flocked to Jesus even though they hated Jewish people. He flashed my entire life on a screen just like this one, and I just adore him. What? We worked so hard trying to hide some of those things from each other, but now Jesus, he put it all up there. I love that guy. That guy told me everything wrong I ever did. I can't spend enough time with him. Kind of makes you wonder why there is any shame when we go to Jesus in prayer. You have to come see this man. Listen to the impact. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've actually heard it for ourselves. And we know this man really is the savior of the world. And all of this happened, my friends, because Jesus decided to go out of his way. He didn't go this way. He was supposed to go. He went out of his way. I was thinking about that power in Jesus' decision to go out of his way. As a result, Samaritans get saved. And I was thinking about a little church in Virginia. And this little church in Virginia, they went out of their way to have a revival meeting. You all remember revival meetings? Anybody remember? It's the kind of thing where you had a preacher come into town and they talked every night about church stuff, like for on and on and on, like two hours. And if they weren't, didn't have a lot of content, they just made up for it in volume. <laughs> you know, they kind of preached harder. And, you know, they were having a revival. This little small church in Virginia went out of their way to hold this revival meeting and they paid some evangelists to come in and speak. They took that out of their budget and They went out of their way and they paid for these utilities and for staff to help lead the music. And they went out of their way. They had these volunteers who adjusted their schedules to keep nursery and children and all that kind of stuff and take up the offering. This little church, they went out of their way and actually bought some Sunday school curriculum. And they put it in all their Sunday school classrooms. And I was in one of these little Sunday school classrooms with painted cinder block walls and a picture of Jesus sitting outside a door. And in that Sunday school classroom, this teacher said something I'd heard a thousand times, but that teacher went out of the way to prepare a lesson plan. And the teacher said, you're never going to be truly happy until you're in the center of God's will for your life. And I was 19 years old. And it was there on February 22nd, 1987, that I accepted my call to ministry because of a little church and a whole lot of great people that went out of their way. That went out of their way. This verse has kind of been a testimony of mine. I think it'll be a testimony of yours too. See if it, see if it rings as truth. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly because it used to be so difficult for me to even talk to people about Jesus. The shame and guilt were killer. Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, all that was poured out in me. Here's a trustworthy saying that 
deserves full acceptance by you, and I hope you have accepted it. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom Tom is the worst. And that's why Christ Jesus came, to save a lousy guy like me. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who believe on him and receive eternal life. Amen? You're sitting in a place today, and it's a great place, that is a testimony to this church's willingness to go out of your way. Make it very clear. Let there be no doubt. You sacrificed and volunteered and prayed and served to go out of your way because we found out there were 96,000 people there. And we went out of our way and we went here in hopes that 96,000 people might meet Jesus at the well and find this living water. Whatever footwear they have when they come, whatever they have, we went out of our way, so we're not going to classify them because they make us uncomfortable. We are going to so mess them up with some love. I'm glad you came. Those are some funky shoes. I have two pairs, and I'd like to tell you about my two pairs. And they're going to come. Listen to me, guys. They're going to come. They're going to come. And we're going to go out of our way. And we are going to serve. And we are going to volunteer long hours like many of you have over this weekend. And we are going to give sacrificially. And we are going to get involved awkwardly with people. And we will love unconditionally, even if it stretches us. And this is perhaps the most important thing. We who call alive Wesley in our home, we will constantly put ourselves before the gaze of the Holy Spirit, expressing the desire for him to continue to do his beautiful good work in us. And we will work on ourselves to remove those dreaded classifications. And we will go out of our way and point the way to a Savior who went out of his way all the way to a cross. And that's what we're going to do. And so this week, as you go about your life, I pray it's a blessed week for you. But most importantly, I pray that you will listen to the prompting. And if God calls you to go out of your way, you'll be willing. You'll be willing. Don't freak people out. Don't say, hey, God told me to come. No, I'm not saying that. Just, just love them. I can see you're having a hard day. Can I help? Anything I can pray for you? I mean, I know it's weird. Just be willing to go out of your way because truth be told, somebody went out of their way for you. And a good many of you are drinking of living water because somebody went out of their way for you. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the day. Thank you for this beautiful place and these beautiful people. Lord, this was a great facility. But when this church showed up, it became a beautiful, beautiful church. Thank you for these people today that were part of this significant Sunday. Thank you, Father, that as we talked about your interaction with this lady at the well, so many of us can relate. We know what that feels like and seems like. And I pray for my friends in the room today, especially those who maybe, maybe they're still at that seek mode and they're still trying to figure out what's going to bring them peace. It's going to make them feel whole. Would you, Father, power of your Holy Spirit, draw them fully to your side? You can do that, guys. You can do it right now. If you, if you sense in your heart God is calling you to something, just say, Lord, I'm coming. I don't understand. I want to be part of the living water. Just, just tell me. Direct me. And you tell somebody before you leave. Come find me. Tell me. Tell anybody. Any of the ushers say, hey, I just did that. What should I do next? Oh, my friends in your room, listen, Lord, if there are people in here and they're still wrestling with shame and the guilt of stuff that happened yesterday or even today, oh, God, would you give them a blessing of yourself? Would you let them, Father, 
understand that Jesus that says, here's everything you've ever done, and I can't wait to spend time with you. Oh, Lord, by the power of your spirit, break through those walls and let that happen. And now, Lord, as pastor of this church, we come into your presence and say, we will be a church that goes out of our way to reach the 96,000 you've placed in our care. We will go out of our way, Lord, because we know you have called us. And it is our desire that all 96,000 people would come to a saving knowledge of who you are and the kingdom of heaven would be absolutely in an uproar. And more importantly, even here on this earth, people would wonder what is happening over there in Pickens County. We'll go out of our way because we all know Somebody went out of the way for me. You are good. You are beautiful. We are honored to be in your presence. All God's people said,